Welcome. Thank you for joining us for COVID-19, the science of vaccines. This session is part of the Mortgage Institute for Research's Fearless Science Seminar Series. Today is February 24th, 2021. My name is Gabriela Gerhardt. I work for the Mortgage Institute for Research and I will be moderating the session today. The Mortgage Institute is an independent biomedical institute in Madison, Wisconsin. We work in partnership with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our scientists recognize that a fundamental understanding of human biology will drive the next big advances in human health. Virology research is one of the focus areas of the Mortgage Institute. The John and Jean Rowe Center for Research in Virology, led by Dr. Paul Alquist, focuses on unlocking the secrets of virus-host interactions to better protect human health. As we all are acutely aware, more than one year in, the pandemic continues. In the United States, we have just hit a tragic milestone, 500,000 deaths due to COVID-19. I'm sure many of you joining us today are eager to find out more about vaccines. We hope you enjoy hearing directly from experts and leave with a better understanding of how the virus functions and how we can fight it with both treatments and vaccines. The format for today's session will be three lectures, one by each speaker. Afterward, we will all come together for a question and answer session. We plan to wrap up around 5.30 p.m. Please take a look at the chat section on the right side of your screen. Feel free to ask questions as we go by writing in the, them in the chat and marking them as questions. We may choose some of these to answer during the live Q&A. Please note that all of these lectures were pre-recorded and the speakers may participate in the chat during the lectures with links and additional information. I'm joined today by three experts. If you all wanna join, great. So uh, Dr. Yohan Demboon, give a wave is a virologist here at the Mortgage Institute for Research, part of the Rowe Center for Research in Virology, and an affiliate of the UW-Madison Institute for Molecular Virology. He has been studying basic virology and RNA viruses for more than 30 years. Welcome, Yon. Dr. William R. Hartman, give a wave, is an associate professor of anesthesiology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. He served as the principal investigator on two studies to treat COVID-19, the UW Adult and Pediatric COVID-19 Convalescent Plasma Program and the UW Regeneron Clinical Trials. He is currently the principal investigator for the UW AstraZeneca COVID-19 Vaccine Trial. Welcome, Bill. Dr. James Conway is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. He is the medical director of the UW Health Immunization Program, associate director of UW-Madison Global Health Institute, director of Office of Global Health for the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, and the Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellowship Program Director. Welcome, Jim. So let's go ahead and dive right into the lectures. First up is going to be Dr. Yoan Den Boon. Hold on just a moment while I get the video started. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Johan Den Boon. I'm a staff scientist at the Mortgage Institute for Research, and I'll be happy to take the lead on this discussion about coronavirus vaccine development. And uh, before we do so, I'd like you to know a little bit about the basics of the biology of a SARS coronavirus 2 infection. SARS coronavirus 2, of course, being the causative agent of COVID-19 disease. While I do that, I'll have an opportunity to point out targets for drug treatments, vaccine development, I talk about different types of vaccines, and especially also in the end, touch uh, a little bit on the fact that everybody's worried about these virus variants that are popping up left and right. So we've known coronavirus for a long time. This is an electron micrograph of an infectious bronchitis virus taken way back in the 70s. And in fact, we've known these viruses even decades before that. And uh, the artist impression, the CDC image that everybody's familiar with, does pretty good justice to what we see on the electron micrograph. You can see the spike-like projections that give the virus its name as a corona around the particle. So what do these viruses do? It's pretty simple. They like to get into your cells. They like to persuade you to multiply them and then get out and infect a new cell, either in your body or somebody else's body. So it reminds me of uh, a chain letter where a chain letter comes into your doorstep and uh, is being asked to be copied a bunch of times and be sent to your friends and neighbors. And in fact, um, we call the outside of these viruses the viral envelope, this lipid membrane around the virus, as if it's a letter. And uh, we have proteins that we just call envelope proteins. And in fact, these spike proteins that are sitting on the outside are kind of like an address label that target this virus to the right kind of cell. 
So to know what's going on inside these infected cells, we first have to look inside the virus itself. Inside the virus is this genetic information that is the blueprint for how to make new viruses. In this case, it's called an RNA molecule. It's protected by another set of, set of proteins called the nucleocapsid. So the problem for this virus is that the host cells, your, your cells, my cells, do not know how to copy RNA. And of course, the RNA needs to be copied because it needs to be provided as a copy in every new particle that's produced. You and I know how to store genetic information in DNA and how to copy and uh, distribute that. And normally that we use, uh, we use a process called transcription to then convert that into an RNA molecule that becomes the message to, to, to be further on uh, translated by translating machinery into active molecules called proteins. These viruses, these RNA viruses have decided to totally forego the use of DNA. By that, they've made a decision that now they have to provide an RNA copying machine because the cells don't know how to do it. So it turns out that these viruses take their large genomes and, and dedicate about 70% or so to making viral copying machines, the proteins that build these copying machines. They get produced, they have some enzymatic functions that are like molecular scissors that cut them into bite-sized units that then assemble and are capable of taking an RNA, feeding it through, and in the process, produce a copy of the, of the RNA strand. This is a process that my colleagues and I are spending most of our waking hours on in the Morgan's Institute, uh, understanding the mechanisms of how this works. And we're lately uh, focused a lot on how to visualize this under high powerful electron microscopes. The other part of the viral genome, the last third in the back end, produces the proteins that we've already seen that end up in the new virus particles, the spike, the envelope, the matrix, and the nucleocapsid proteins. Um, but in order to, to do this, um, the virus first needs to make partial copies of the genome that now position these coding instructions at the front end of each of these RNAs, which biology demands them to be uh, to be accessible. And you can already see that these coronaviruses have decided to produce even more kinds of proteins, these light blue proteins, that are important for um, the virus to defend itself against all kinds of response mechanisms that we have as hosts. So these, these proteins are being sent up as attack dogs to uh, counteract important first line defenses like built around interferon or tetherin, for example. Um, by now, you know that this cartoon that I'm showing is by far too is simplistic and is lucky that we have folks like Fukovsky et al. that uh, have provided much better illustrations of what goes on between virus going in and virus going out, all the things that I've just discussed before. And these illustrations also provide an opportunity to say where we can potentially target with drugs the, all the processes that go on, for example, the remdesivir that most people have heard about that tried to jam up the viral synthesis mechanisms. Uh, the, the figure also provides a step up to start talking about vaccines, and that's about virus entry. What we really want to do is the virus to not get into these cells at all. And we can recruit all our powerful arsenal of immune cells to start making antibodies that can glom onto these viruses and prevent the spike that normally interacts with receptors on the outside of the cell. To, uh, to establish a close interaction with the cells that later on becomes uh, the motivation for the cell to swallow up these viruses. So if we can block them with antibodies, they can get in. Now, this is a process that normally takes weeks. And of course, that's way too long in the course of an initial infection that also just takes weeks. So we need to train our cells to recognize these enemies before they actually arrive. And the way to do that is to use vaccines. We can provide our body with uh, a simulation of the infection by providing a whole virus. But if we uh, if we do that to teach our body how to recognize these things, we better make sure that this virus is, uh, is inactivated and dead, or at least severely crippled to not launch a full-blown infection. So this is the approach that Chinese vaccines uh, is taking. Uh, but perhaps more elegant ways is to just focus a vaccine on the, the subunit proteins, the spike proteins, so not the entire virus, that needs to be targeted for uh, raising neutralizing antibodies. So if you could provide just the spike protein, uh, that might be sufficient. Now that's in practice an unsurmountable challenge because you can never make enough purified clean protein to, uh, to have sufficient amounts for a full vaccination uh, program. So instead what folks do is uh, they provide the instructions of how to make a spike protein. 
You can either do this to try and try and test the methods that use vaccine uh, viral vectors like adeno adenovirus by giving them a payload of bringing along the instructions for making a spike protein. The drawback of that, of course, is that the immune response will reasonably also be expected to not only be against the coronavirus spike, but also against the vehicle that carries that payload. And if you have to use the vaccine repeatedly, like every year, that might uh, decrease its potency. So Pfizer and Moderna have taken another approach and just simply providing an RNA that encodes the spike protein as is. And of course, that has the drawback that RNA is inherently fragile. So you have to keep it rock solid frozen before you're ready to inject it in somebody's arms. But the good thing is that that kind of a molecule is easily adaptable to any kind of changes the virus tro throws at us. And that brings me to these variants that everybody's worried about. RNA replication is inherently error prone and every new molecule of RNA will have at least one or two mutations. In most cases, these mutations are um, insignificant or even detrimental, a dead end for the virus. But in some cases, it provides an advantage. Mutations in the RNA replication machinery could make it more accurate or faster. Mutations in these accessory proteins could launch an even greater attack to our first line defenses and make us even sicker. And mutations in the spike, uh, of course, are of concern when you want to develop vaccines. So our own Rob Kirchdorfer uh, here at UW Madison is an expert in looking at structures of spikes. The spike is actually a trimer of three copies of the spike protein. And uh, here you show an image where it's interacting with the ACE2 receptor. And Rob has very nicely color coded the mutations that are present in the UK variant in, in magenta, in the South African variant in green, and in, in the Brazilian variant in, in orange. And interestingly, there are several mutations that are shared between multiple of these variants. And some of these are right where the receptor uh, is interacting with this spike. So they're of concern. And also because those would be the prime positions where you would want to launch a neutralizing antibody to bind to prevent this interaction. So uh, luckily, most of our vaccines currently are still effective, even against these mutants to a, a, reasonably, a reasonably good level. So we should keep getting vaccinated. And of course, the, uh, the interesting part is why these things arise. We see that they have many mutations and it suggests that there have been enough time for these viruses to actually try out different combinations of mutations. Um, and that would be especially possible in patients that have prolonged active infections. And we're thinking that uh, maybe immunocompromised people that are sometimes capable of producing virus for months instead of weeks. Are, are perfect in a perfect position to actually uh, give rise to these variants. The remedy, of course, is to make sure that people don't get infected in the first place. So do everything you're already doing and also keep going on with vaccination. And the other side of that is that we also need to be vigilant about surveying the coronavirus evolution to anticipate any of these variants coming up in the future. And I'm lucky, uh, happy to say that UW Madison is actively involved in these sequencing efforts. And with that, I think I'll turn it over. I've set the stage for uh, our next two speakers to talk about uh, what's going on with vaccine development, design, trial and error, and implementation. Um, that's where I'll leave it. Where I'll leave it. My name is Bill Hartman, and I'm an anesthesiologist here at UW Health, and one of the many, many frontline healthcare workers that's had the opportunity to care for our patients during this pandemic. I've also been charged with the awesome responsibility and the exciting opportunity to lead many of the COVID clinical trials at UW that have essentially all had the same endpoint. That is, we've, we've aimed to find therapeutics and preventatives that attack and neutralize that spike protein that we've just learned about. In many ways, the benchtop researchers have really made my life easier by focusing us towards the single target and teaching us that this is really where the battle needs to be waged. So understanding the need for new therapeutics and preventatives, and in conjunction with the leadership of UW Health and the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, uh, UW has used a coordinated and calculated and very educated approach to confronting COVID with the single goal of investigating uh, beneficial therapies to directly and quickly help our patients in Madison the people of Wisconsin, and really uh, all the people of the world. And so as I talk about a few of these clinical trials that we've had going on, I want to put up this slide here so that you can see 
a, a sampling of the many people that have made all of this possible. And I wish I could name all of them by name, um, but that would take uh, too, too long to do. Uh, but these are incredible people, incredibly dedicated, uh, and the awesome Office of Clinical Trials uh, is the unsung heroes of this, of this pandemic, as they've always walked in step with me, usually two or three steps ahead of me, uh, to make sure that we have everything that we need and that the <clears throat> participants in the trials are all up to date and, and completely understanding of what they're about to undertake. Uh, we have a tremendous thank, thank you that goes out to the community as well uh, and the participants who have stepped up and volunteered for these trials. And we, we're just very grateful for the participation of everyone <clears throat> who's made all of this possible. Our first uh, goal was to, to put out the fire. Last March when COVID came to uh, the United States and uh, COVID-19 was spreading quickly, uh, we didn't have any effective therapeutic options. We were treating people symptomatically uh, and we were doing the best that we could, but we didn't have anything that was directly attacking uh, COVID-19. And so our first goal was to, to put out this fire and uh, help find a quick and effective therapeutic option so that we could treat our patients uh, here at UW. Neutralizing the virus was going to be key. And so we looked at passive and active immuno, uh, immunity strategies. And history had suggested that the quickest way to get uh, antibodies into people to neutralize this virus was to take them from someone who's already recovered from the virus uh, in a way that uh, we can give their, the, the, those antibodies to someone who's still, who's still sick in the hospital and hope that neutralizing that virus and making them healthy again would happen just like the person who uh, had created those antibodies in the first place. And that's called convalescent plasma. And convalescent plasma has been around for 100 years, uh, probably longer. Uh, it was the subject of the first Nobel Prize. And we knew that if we uh, could take the plasma from uh, the, the healthy person who's, who's recovered from COVID-19, give it to the sick person, that there's a chance that those antibodies would work again and make that sick person better. So we had joined forces with Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, Mount Sinai in New York, <coughs> and Houston Methodist Hospital. And this consortium soon became over 2,600 hospitals, uh, really worldwide. And in coordination with our Office of Clinical Trials, with our UW Blood Bank, with the American Red Cross, uh, we helped develop a program utilizing the FDA EIND protocol to deliver convalescent plasma to sick and hospitalized patients. And this required uh, a lot of teaching the public about what convalescent plasma was so that we could uh, recruit donors, but test potential donors to see if, donors if, to see if they still had uh, antibodies uh, or if they still had COVID, uh, collect their plasma, and then we had to ship it to the hospital where it had to be stored, thawed, cataloged, and administered to all patients. The EIND protocol was going to work, but uh, in looking at it, it looked like it was going to take too much time to get plasma to the patient because there was a very high administrative burden and too many inefficiencies in the system. And so Mayo Clinic took the lead in developing an emergency access program, or an EAP, which would ease the administrative burden and allow us to get plasma to patients more quickly. So we set aside the EIND program and quickly rewrote the workflow and the hospital orders to utilize Mayo's EAP. And despite having to write all of these workflows twice, the time from the concept to the first transfusion was 15 days. And we were one of the first institutions in the country to utilize convalescent plasma. And our experience helped turn the tide for COVID-19 uh, because we had a little bit of luck in that we didn't have an early surge of COVID patients. And because of the aggressive media campaign and the generosity of the people of Madison and, and Dane County, uh, greater than one third of the nation's convalescent plasma supply for the first several weeks of the pandemic was right here in Madison. And so through the work of Dr. Connor and the blood bank, uh, we were able to transfuse our patients really within 48 hours of admission. And so we were the first uh, institution to report that early transfusion 
was being associated with decreased progression to life-threatening disease and ICU admissions. And so by being able to uh, use convalescent plasma early, we were able to keep people uh, uh, sick with COVID out of the ICU, off of ventilators, and reduce overall mortality. We <laughs> published that experience uh, uh, so that others could, could learn from it as well. And on the, the far right here, I show an email that came from Dr. Arturo Casadevall of Johns Hopkins, who's led the National Consortium for Convalescent Plasma here, who credited uh, University of Wisconsin with making the critical contribution to the plasma project of treating patients early. And when that experience got around it, and other people began to do so, they saw mortality begin to drop. And this was a huge deal in the early days of the plasma story. The middle graph uh, doesn't come from our work, but comes from uh, the, the group down in Houston. But they saw when you used high titer uh, convalescent plasma and used it early within the first 48 hours of a, of a person being admitted to the hospital with COVID-19, those that were transfused with convalescent plasma uh, had a reduced mortality by about half compared to those who were not transfused. And so convalescent plasma was uh, finally approved by the FDA uh, for emergency use or an EUA. Uh, and through that uh, EUA, convalescent plasma could then be used outside of a clinical trial. And this reduced the administrative burden of giving convalescent plasma to essentially zero, uh, which meant that it was available to all patients at all hospitals. And so that hospitals that were understaffed or cared for underserved populations could easily obtain convalescent plasma and transfuse patients. So convalescent plasma was available to everyone, which is a big health equity issue. This had a natural transition then to monoclonal antibodies. As monoclonal antibodies are cloned from convalescent plasma, they look for the, the most neutralizing antibodies to the virus, which is really to the, to the spike protein. And they're able to grow those uh, antibodies up in large quantities and put them together as, as a medicine. And so that they just give uh, this medicine as, a, as an infusion to uh, a person uh, so they don't get all of the antibodies or, or all of the uh, potential uh, uh, infection that, that could come from plasma, although plasma is very safe. But th this is a very clean medicine with just one or two antibodies, depending on which one that, that, you, that we're using. Uh, we studied uh, or we began studies with Regeneron back in June, looking at their monoclonal antibody cocktail, which contains two uh, different antibodies that both uh, are very specific for that spike protein. And we did, or we participated in, in all three arms of Regeneron study. So the inpatient arm, the outpatient arm, and a preventative arm. This preventative arm was very novel at the time because it aimed to treat people uh, with a essential uh, passive vaccine uh, so that they had antibodies in their system. And the reason they did this uh, was to prevent them from getting COVID-19. Uh, so the people that were studied uh, lived under the same roof as those who, as, as a person who already had a COVID-19 infection. Again, with the with with the goal of preventing uh, those people from from developing COVID-19. And what was seen here was that, especially in the the outpatient arm, was that. Uh, we were able to uh, reduce medical visits in people who are at risk of developing severe disease. And so as an outpatient, if a person received uh, this Regeneron monoclonal antibody, or these antibodies to that spike protein, they were able to clear the disease very quickly, usually within five to seven days, <laughs> feel a lot better uh, and actually become uh, less infectious overall. And so, uh, this was uh, 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 thought to be a, a very effective way to reduce hospitalizations uh, in people with COVID-19 infections. The inpatient trial for, for patients who were already intubated or on high nasal flow oxygen uh, was put on indefinite pause because we didn't see uh, any sort of positive outcomes at that point. 
within the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, the results from the, the passive vaccine trial in which, uh, again, people who live under the same roof but aren't COVID uh, infected uh, are given uh, the antibodies, so they have antibodies in their system to help fight off COVID uh, infection as uh, someone else in their house does have COVID-19. And uh, I've never seen this before, but what they saw or what they, what they have found is that it was 100% effective in preventing symptomatic infection. Where this would be important now are in the nursing homes, in prisons, or, or in any sort of group home situation where uh, many people are living under the same roof. It's help, <coughs> able to prevent, <coughs> excuse me, able to prevent infection uh, in these situations uh, and, and really reduce uh, the overall uh, burden on hospitals. And finally, uh, the, the Regeneron uh, was approved for uh, FDA, uh, or the FDA approved Regeneron uh, for the outpatient EUA or, uh, to be used uh, for emergency use so that Regeneron could not j just be used for people like the President of the United States uh, who received it when he got sick, but for everybody. And they provided it uh, free of charge to qualified patients. And the last trial uh, is a way to attack this spike protein uh, using the vaccines. And these vaccines, while they are, are all made a little bit different, the one that we studied here at UW by AstraZeneca is an adenovirus vaccine, um, but the others, the mRNA vaccines that have already been approved, they all have the same endpoint, which is to produce the spike protein so that you can uh, produce antibodies to it. So that if your body sees one of these uh, COVID-19 and uh, viruses coming into your body, it's able to attack it right away with those antibodies. And this has been one of the uh, most difficult uh, trials to run uh, as we've had to do everything that a classical vaccine trial would do, but in a much shorter time frame. And so typically where you would have, uh, let's say two or three years to recruit people in the phase three uh, trials, we had a couple of months, two or three months, to be able to get those 30,000 people here in the United States. The status of that trial uh, is about to be uh, released as the U.S. enrollment is now complete. We're still putting all the data uh, together so that we can uh, help put together the, the report so that they can uh, release the, the efficacy uh, answers so that we'll know by the end of this month how efficacious this particular uh, vaccine is. And we'll continue to follow up on these participants for the next two years so that we know how long that immunity lasts. And this here in the United States was designed better than those abroad. And so I anticipate uh, that we'll get more concrete answers and less data ambigu ambiguity. And so finally, I, I just want to, to reiterate that the, the approach to attacking the spike protein and to clinical trials here at University of Wisconsin has been very calculated and educated with the goal of bringing the best therapies and preventatives to Wisconsin. The trials that we've participated in so far have resulted in, to, in two emergency youth authorizations or EUAs with likely at least two more to come. And we've been a very uh, vocal uh, and, and, and a true leader uh, in this fight against COVID. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the, the, the great work that the Office of Clinical Trials here has done. And we have more exciting trials to come. Uh, so I, I hope to have uh, more to report to you uh, in the future. But for now, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dr. James Conway. I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist, and I've spent much of my career working on immunizations and immunization system strengthening, as well as working within the global health realm. And I'm gonna talk briefly about the challenges of rapidly developing and distributing COVID-19 vaccines to respond to this unprecedented pandemic. You know, I think it's important to recognize how quickly all of this has evolved. You know, from the very beginning of January, when this was first identified in China, 
and then quickly being published in a New England Journal article that actually laid out the entire genomic sequence of this entire virus a little over just a year ago. And as we realized how quickly we needed to respond to this, we needed to understand exactly what we understood about coronaviruses in general. And I think people need to understand that coronavirus infections are extraordinarily common. They're commonly found during the winter and spring months here in the United States. And these are worldwide viruses that circulate routinely. About 60% of kids and almost 90% of adults who are over the age of 50 have antibodies against coronaviruses, which demonstrates how common these are. Now we've had previous outbreaks with fairly significant and more severe versions of coronaviruses. And I think everybody's aware of both the SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS outbreaks. And we know that in those outbreaks, at least, that the antibodies from those infections and people that had survived them lasted for about a year. However, we also know that for the routine coronaviruses, that mucosal immunity or the immunity that persists on the, the surfaces of our nose and throats and airways only lasts for some months after the infection. And although people have secretory immunity that can be detected for some time, the circulating immunity that, that people can measure doesn't necessarily predict that they're gonna be protected. In fact, future and reinfections are actually quite common. So then thinking about how we would get out of this pandemic, it would, became quite obvious that a vaccine would be needed or in fact, many vaccines. And so let's think about what vaccines need to do and how we think about vaccines as we develop them. So it comes down basically to two different questions. Are they safe and do they work? So efficacy is the how they work part. And that's where we look at, can we produce immune protection that protects against infection? We would like that immunity to be long lasting. We would like it to be easily boosted either by people being exposed to the virus or ideally people then getting revaccinated we would like this to prevent infection, but also to prevent transmission to others and shedding of virus is what we call that. We would like to activate multiple parts of the immune system. You hear a lot about people measuring antibodies against the various vaccines, but we would really like to be able to activate the T cells that help kill viruses and direct traffic in the immune system, as well as the B cells that make those antibodies. And as we've realized over time and what the previous experience with coronavirus has taught us, we would really like something that is actually better than wild type infection, better than the infections that we see when people are actually infected by these wild type coronaviruses. As far as safety, we would obviously like something that has minimal side effects and doesn't seem to have any long-term side effects. And we have to take into consideration that we don't want anything that causes an enhanced immune response when people get infected. Now, while this may seem sort of a strange idea, we know that in previous vaccines that people have tried to develop against respiratory syncytial virus called RSV or dengue, those vaccines in prior attempts have actually been shown to make things worse when people got infected because they prime the immune system and get it all ready to respond. And that when the infection occurs, an over response happens that actually makes things worse than they otherwise would have been. And so because of that, we've had to be extraordinarily careful in designing the studies to make sure that these are safe vaccines. So when we put all that together, what are the challenges then to try to develop vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19? Well, one is we know that the natural immunity to coronaviruses appears to be short-lived and that these serum antibodies don't necessarily predict mucosal immunity, which is really where you need to be protected when you get exposed to these viruses. We don't really know what the best marker of that immunity is. You know, people have been generally measuring antibodies, but we know that there's a lot more components to the immune system. And so when we're measuring how good these things protect, in many cases, what we've seen is that we have to just look for real world efficacy. Do these protect people that are vaccinated when they're in the midst of outbreaks? We've also struggled in trying to figure out what's the best target for the vaccine. Currently, everything is focused on the spike glycoprotein, which my colleagues have talked about, but maybe there are other components of these viruses that might actually be more amenable to making better immunity. And so that's gonna to continue to be investigated. I think everybody's been concerned about and hearing about these mutant variants that have been circulating. And the question is gonna be how well do these current vaccines protect against those mutations and how often or how will we update those vaccines and modulate them so that they actually continue to protect as the virus keeps changing. And then one of the big questions is what's the best way to deliver these vaccines into the human body to develop immunity? 
know, I think most vaccines are given intramuscularly, but there may be better ways to present these vaccines to the immune system so that it responds even better. These could be given orally or intranasally, maybe under the skin or intradermally within the skin. And there is some logic to those because there's a lot more immune cells or a lot more immune tissue in those areas that may make these work better if they're given into areas different from where most vaccines are currently given, which is into muscles. I mentioned that we wanna make sure we avoid this enhanced disease after vaccination. We certainly know in children and some young adults that there is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome or what's called Miss C disease. And obviously we wanna avoid that and make sure that people that have been vaccinated don't get this hyperimmune response to the infection. How long will the immunity last and how often will we need to give boosters still needs to be sorted out? How do we sort out the fact that we generally test vaccines in healthy young people knowing that the target population for these vaccines has been in older individuals and people with comorbidities, people with other medical conditions who are often excluded from uh, most vaccine um, uh, trials. And then how do we accelerate this process and work through what is usually a very gradual and deliberate, somewhat bureaucratic progressive process to get these things approved and then eventually moving into mass manufacture and mass delivery. And then finally, how do we target these into the most high risk groups that will benefit from them, as well as understanding that we need to figure out a way to equitably distribute these and administer these to the general population. So those are the things that keep me awake at night. Now, what are the reasons I think that we actually have reasons for some optimism that may even be more than modest optimism? Well, first off, this has been an unprecedented global effort to develop vaccines, both collaboration among scientists to understand these viruses and the immunity, as well as collaboration between companies and the, the widespread sharing of information, including pre-printed manuscripts before they even reach the formal presentation mode that most of us wait for. We know that there are a lot of potential vaccine candidates on a lot of different technologies that are being brought, to, being brought to bear, which I think is great reason for optimism. A lot of money being put into research and development, some element of national competition, which is certainly always a good thing to try to move things forward quickly. This novel approach to the research and development and the production that I'll talk about in a moment. And then prior efforts to develop vaccines against other coronaviruses, while those didn't amount to a final response to those diseases as they largely died out on their own, that previous effort had already given us some templates to be able to develop vaccines. And then finally, the idea that we needed to move quickly into the higher risk populations. And so actually including older individuals, including people with comorbidities, including women of childbearing age, most groups of which are actually excluded from most virus vaccine trials previous to this one. Now, this is a little bit of a busy schematic, and one of my colleagues briefly talked about the different types of vaccines, but I thought it was just worthwhile for people to understand how many different approaches to vaccines have been taken throughout history. And so if you go through this entire um, wheel, you can see that we've had efforts that have used just certain pr products of the organisms, uh, things called toxoids, We've used certain molecules from these things like polysaccharides and conjugated polysaccharides. We've used the whole pathogen. We've re done reassortant live vaccines, things like the rotavirus vaccine. We've done just pieces of certain organisms, what are called split and subunit vaccines. And then what had been considered sort of futuristic, although potentially the best answer for future vaccines had been this idea of using genetic material like um, plasmids and mRNA and obviously those at least have been some of the first vaccines out of the gate that have been most successful in making it to the market here in the United States. But not forgetting that there's a lot of other very successful models for vaccines, and in fact, many other COVID-19 vaccines that are being developed using these models. So how are vaccines usually developed in the, the old days, which would be basically a couple of years ago? So in phase one, you have a small number of healthy individuals who help work out what's the right dose of the vaccine before moving into several hundred individuals who then look at both rare and common side effects as well as getting some information about how well people respond to these vaccines. And then moving into phase three, which is where hundreds or even hundreds of thousands potentially of volunteers then actually test the vaccine to see how well it actually protects against particular diseases. And then also looks in a larger population for rarer side effects to make sure that these vaccines are safe to bring into larger populations. 
Now, what was done here for the COVID-19 vaccines, I think was really novel, but in fact, it may actually represent a new way of doing these things in a new world order for developing vaccines. So this is an article that came out early in the pandemic in the New England Journal of Medicine. And on the top of the slide, you can see the usual progress that a vaccine goes through from a preclinical phase into the phase one, phase two, and phase three before it's eventually licensed. And only after, after it's licensed would a pharmaceutical company then obviously make a big investment to then large scale manufacture it. What was done in this case, both here in the United States with Operation Warp Speed, as well as with many other development programs around the world, was basically stacking some of these tasks. So that as you can see on the top here in the pale blue, the process of going from phase one to phase two to phase three was actually overlapped in some circumstances or was accelerated so that the FDA was available and willing to rapidly review these processes in real time rather than this sort of you submit all your data, we sit on it and think about it for a while. And in fact, moving these things along in real time. But where Operation Warp Speed really worked was actually then taking away the financial disincentive for companies to build and, and develop the manufacturing and packaging and shipping um, processes so that there wasn't gonna be a long delay after approval of these vaccines before they could actually make it to the market. And that's really the part that actually I think was most remarkable and really was a credit to the governments around the world for be being willing and able to commit finances to be able to actually remove those delays by encouraging companies to do the science while they had the financial disincentive of actually developing the manufacturing part removed uh, in a kind of a no fault system. The other part of this that had to be worked out, and again was rapidly worked out in the fall of 2020, was that the FDA had never approved vaccines under this emergency use authorization that has been used primarily for drugs to treat conditions. And what they issued back in September, what was called the playbook, where they basically laid out what would be the requirements for companies to actually seek and obtain emergency use authorization. And what this basically entailed was creating the standards, which essentially are the equivalent of what the European Union for full, requires for full approval to basically be able to rapidly approve these to be able to use in the United States. As I mentioned, this is a worldwide effort. You can see on this map, which is from vaxmap.org, all of the different processes that are being um, brought to bear around the entire globe. And though while many of us are, uh, are really focused on the United States, you can see that this has really been a global effort. The WHO actually maintains some really nice materials that track the development of vaccines. And you can see from checking just this morning that the number of vaccines in currently clinical development programs, there's 70 of those. And there's another 181 that are in preclinical development. And when you look down here on the bottom, this is all the different techniques that are being used to bring vaccines to the market and being able to use them for human use. And you can see on down this list, well, protein subunits, which have been used in many circumstances in the past, and live viral vaccines or live attenuated viruses, there's a lot of newer technologies that are being developed. And you can see that these are really across the board how many different types are being developed. The New York Times actually tracks these things quite nicely and encourage people to, to keep an eye on their sites. And so this is where we are with current vaccine development with 37 vaccines in phase one, and you can see on down the line, six of them that have been authorized and are in early or limited use and four that have been approved, again, all over the world with at least four that have been abandoned so far. And these are the leading vaccines. And you can see that here in the United States, we have Pfizer and Moderna, uh, Johnson & Johnson is now under review, Novavax and um, AstraZeneca um, have been moving forward with trials here in the United States. You can see there are actually quite a few other vaccines around the world that are already in various stages of approval and actually are being distributed in many countries around the world, most of these coming from China, Russia, and India. Here in the United States, the Operation Warp Speed approach basically put all of our eggs into 10 baskets. Um, we've got two vaccines that are now EUA approved, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, both by mRNA technology. One is currently under review by the FDA, that's the Johnson & Johnson adenovirus viral vector vaccine. And then everybody I think has heard about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines, which have now enrolled enough patients and are now following them for making sure that these are safe and effective and will likely be submitted at some point in the coming months. Novavax, another vaccine using a protein subunit model, has also uh, nearly completed their enrollment. And so we will likely see multiple vaccines. You can also see though that some of the vaccines 
from GSK and Sanofi, as well as Merck, have been abandoned because they just didn't pan out. And so where are we with vaccine distribution here now in this country? So we are on the order of somewhere between 1.4 and 1.7 million doses a day being administered. We've given far more vaccines here in the United States than any other country in the world. But it, you can see that this pace, unfortunately, is still going to be relatively gradual to getting to the point where we think we need to be with what is termed herd immunity. How many people in the community really need to be immune before you can start talking about completely eradicating these diseases. And so I think most people have heard that numbers somewhere between 70 and 90% would be really what would be required for the amount of immunity that people would have in a community before we would really be able to eliminate these diseases. And so you can see that at the current pace, we wouldn't reach that until next January of 2022. But obviously most of us expect that the pace and the availability of these vaccines is gonna accelerate quite a bit over the coming months. And then finally, just thinking about people's attitudes and thoughts about these vaccines, I think it was understandable that people had questions from the very beginning and there have been surveys on a routine basis to see and check the temperature of the public to see where they stood and where they might stand. You know, it was interesting that even back in June, way before there were even gonna be vaccines available, it was already apparent that not only were many of the public gonna question masking, but many were also gonna question vaccines. And we've continued to track this and follow this. The Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, the AP NORC group, and many others have continued to survey uh, people periodically here in the United States. And you can see that basically gradually as more vaccines are, are distributed and more people know somebody who has received a vaccine, it does seem that more and more people are at least willing to consider these. However, we're still somewhat concerned that in the green here are you know almost 20% of the population that are really very reluctant to get these vaccines. And then another third of the population have basically decided they're gonna wait and see to see how they work and to see what the rest of the population's effects from these are gonna be. And so that 50% obviously makes it extra extraordinarily difficult to get to our goal of 80 or 90% herd immunity. Now, people certainly build in the fact that a decent number of people in this community and in this country have already had SARS-CoV-2 infections, which may be up to a third of the population. But remember what I said earlier, that that immunity from natural infections doesn't seem to last a particularly long period of time. And so while this downslope in cases lately may be a combination of vaccines with people performing good mitigation tasks, as well as some of this natural immunity, we really don't think we can count on that natural immunity. And so we do need to figure out ways to convince the public or reassure the public that these vaccines really will help us exit this, this terrible ride we've been in. And then finally, recognizing the fact uh, as a global health uh, expert, that as much as it may be great to immunize heavily in the Western world and in richer countries, that if the disease continues to circulate in the more uh, limited resource settings, that that doesn't do any of us any good because obviously it's then just a plane ride away to be reintroduced into these areas. And so you can see in the dark blue here, countries that have basically ordered and signed contracts for vastly more vaccine than they really need. And so Canada and the UK, Japan, Australia have ordered on the order of five or six times the number of people even in the country um, is the amount of vaccine that they've ordered. So, you know, I think we all have to expect that once they get whatever vaccine they need for their populations, that hopefully WHO and COVAX will then be able to be supported and be given both the financial, but also the vaccine that they need to support distribution around the rest of the world. Now, cold chain and the ability to maintain these things obviously is somewhat concerning, and the cold storage issues could leave up to three billion of the eight plus billion people on the planet with some difficulty in getting vaccines. And I think there's been a lot of attention paid to the different temperatures that the different vaccines require to be able to maintain them and, and ship them and store them. But I always reassure people or remind people that while the Pfizer vaccines initially had quite uh, rigorous cold standards, those are the same temperatures that steaks and ice cream are shipped at. And I think people are aware that recently the FDA is um, gonna be reviewing data from Pfizer that actually may loosen up how cold these need to be kept so that they would basically be able to be kept at similar temperatures to what most other vaccines that we use are, are, are stored and transported at. So while I think there was a lot made out of this cold chain issue, I think that has worked out and, and will probably be less of an issue than it was in the beginning. And finally, I think as we develop vaccines and distribute them, you know, people keep asking the same questions, when then they, can everybody get back to normal? You know, certainly while we're 
continuing to understand not only how well they work to prevent severe disease and hospitalizations, which all of them seem to be extraordinarily successful at with you know, 90, 95% protection, we're only starting to understand how well they also protect against mild and, and asymptomatic infections, which is really what you need to, to also control to be able to really get back into normalcy. So I think for the time being, while only a limited population of the United States are immunized, I think we're gonna continue to ask people to perform their mitigation activities. But as we get closer to herd immunity and um, see what this uh, out outbreak looks like, you know, we are hopeful that as summer and into the second half of 2021 evolves, that we will hopefully be able to get gradually back to more and more normal behaviors. So that's basically everything I wanted to share regarding how vaccines are developed and in particular during this pandemic, uh, COVID-19. And I appreciate your attention and look forward to discussing some questions. Thank you. We will uh, jump right into a question and answer session. There have been so many questions in the chat that are fantastic. Uh, and I can only do a few, but let's uh, let's dive right in. I was hoping that uh, possibly Bill could comment on if there's been any sort of breaking news uh, or updates in the vaccine world since we recorded these lectures over the last few days. A couple of things. Um, first, uh, Johnson & Johnson is up for uh, a vote for to, to see whether or not they get the FDA uh, EUA approval on Friday. Uh, it's a single shot vaccine, uh, very effective, uh, especially against severe disease and death associated with COVID-19. Uh, we're up around that 90% that range, uh, which, which is amazing. Um, it also is the first of the vaccines to show uh, that there's 82% effectiveness against the South African variant for severe disease and, and death. Um, no other vaccine has come out with this, this data yet. The second thing is that in order to combat some of these variants, uh, the mRNA vaccines, in particular Moderna this afternoon, announced that their booster is ready uh, for, uh, to, to be trialed in, in humans, um, which is uh, excellent since all of these vaccines do show a decreased immunity to, uh, to, to the, the South African variant. And so if we have something that can help fight that variant, um, we're, we're on our, our way to, to a good recovery. Great. And so, you know, moving, just to clarify, uh, there was some question about, you know, the terminology we use, strains, variants, mutations, are those all kind of uh, synonyms for each other? Or is there some uh, specific terminology that we should understand the differences between those? Perhaps Johan, Johan could uh, speak to that. Sure, I think I think variants and mutants are basically, you know, different words for the same thing. Um, the variations are caused by mutations. Uh, once you start talking about strains, you're more thinking about larger changes. Still a coronavirus, but clearly distinguishable. Got it. And then, you know, in terms of the speed of the treatment, the development of a vaccine, I mean, that's what part of what's so extraordinary about about what we've accomplished, uh, what scientists have accomplished in, in terms of this. The speed of of developing that was that was part of that uh, the ability to recruit volunteers, and both for treatments and on the vaccine development angle. Maybe Bill could could uh, comment. Sure. So th the speed comes from a couple of different uh, angles. First, uh, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel at all. These companies built on platforms that had all been established and had been around for a long time. Even the mRNA platform being considered relatively new uh, has still been around 15 to 17 years uh, and, and has been tried uh, in, in other viruses before. Um, the money that, that got poured into this uh, from, from nations uh, all around the world, uh, including the United States, which had put an incredible uh, monetary effort towards uh, bringing vaccines to, uh, from concept to reality as quickly as possible. Uh, and then uh, the ability to uh, set up these trials at, at places like University of Wisconsin, where we have uh, this amazing Office of Clinical Trials uh, that works in conjunction with uh, media outlets uh, and, and really got the word out that these trials are happening. We need volunteers. We need them quickly. Um, the, these, these trials also took place in areas where the virus was very 
available to people. Uh, the, the virus was, was everywhere uh, here in Wisconsin just a short time ago while, we, while our trial was going on. Um, and so all of those things added up to the ability to not only bring these uh, vaccines to market, but then also trial them uh, in, in the large populations of people that are required to do so. And uh, this question, I, I think, is for Jim. What can you can you dive into why it's important to continue to mask after after vaccination, and and maybe how that ties to how vaccines function, what makes them effective? Yeah, I mean, if you think about how the design was set up by the FDA, the primary endpoints were really hospitalizations and severe disease, and it really wasn't built into most of the early trials to be swabbing people regularly that had been vaccinated to see if they had asymptomatic or mild disease. And so that's only now being done in most of the vaccine trials as sort of a secondary endpoint that people are looking at. So until we have enough information about how well these, these do at preventing all infections, not just the severe and the, and the ones that cause people to either die or be hospitalized, we think it's you know prudent and most cautious for people to just continue doing the same things we're doing especially because there's you know, more people that are unimmunized than are immunized. You know, I think once we get to the point where most people are immunized, you know, that's where you'll be able to start you know, essentially trusting that people you're around are actually also protected unto themselves. Because we always have to remember, the masks are primarily to prevent an infected person from transmitting to other people. They may be partially protective for people that are wearing them, but really the primary uh, improvement that we see from masking is that for people that have mild and are shedding virus, they just can't shed it and, and spread it as far. And so that's really the biggest reason that for now we're just asking people to hold tight. You know, the CDC, Fauci announced that, you know, there are going to be guidelines coming out for immunized individuals and their families that are going to start to loosen these things a little bit um, over the next couple of days to give people a little bit more normalcy and also obviously some incentive to get vaccinated. So those will be coming in a couple of days. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's something that People, I guess they hear a 95% effectiveness or 90% effectiveness, and they think that means that they can go back to normal. But uh, you know, there, there is that. So is there a possibility that somebody could still spread the virus even after they've fully been oh, yeah. Im immunized? Yeah, I mean, that's true with lots of different vaccines that, you know, flu vaccine, it's great at preventing people from dying and having severe disease and getting hospitalized. But we know that a decent number of people can still get mild flu and could still certainly transmit it to other people. The goal of most of these vaccines is to prevent that really severe disease. And all of these SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are really extraordinarily effective at doing that. They're really doing exactly what we need them to do. We just need more of them and more people to be able to get them. Great. And so in terms of making a choice about the vaccine, obviously there are two already on the market that are a similar type. And then there are more traditional vaccines that are coming soon. You know, the Johnson & Johnson may be quite soon, AstraZeneca in the near future. Are people, should people have, what criteria should people use to make the decision when they have a choice? Uh, or is it just they should get the first one available to them? Or are there certain classes of people that perhaps should get uh, a, a different type of vaccine given, uh, given particular circumstances? Well, right now, I think it's take what you can get um, for those of us that want to be vac vaccinated. You know, the ACIP, the American um, Council on Immunization Practice, is going to address as we get more and more vaccines coming down the pipeline, whether there are certain vaccines that should be used in certain populations. You know, we know for flu vaccines, we have the high potency and adjuvanted vaccines that are specifically for over 65-year-old individuals. And we may get to a point where there are some vaccines that are directed towards really high risk populations and others for more healthy kind of general population. But right now it's, you know, take what you can get. Once you're eligible, take the vaccine that's offered. Great. And could you also comment on, you know, children is are not part of the current vaccine trial. And I know a lot of people are, are interested in, in what that looks like, um, making a decision about whether or not vaccines are safe for children. Could you comment on, Bill, could you potentially comment on what that looks like for the AstraZeneca future trials and, uh, and, and also just in general what that looks like maybe for the Moderna and the Pfizer as well? Well, the, the, the trials on children uh, can be much smaller. Uh, so we don't need to recruit quite as many people into those trials. Um, the, each of these uh, trials is done in a, in a step-down fashion. And so they'll look first at the 12 to 16 or 12 to 18 uh, age group, and then 
uh, move down in ages down all the way towards uh, towards babies. Um, the uh, trials themselves, the end point is to, to look at antibody levels, um, knowing that there is a correlation between protection and, and antibody levels. And so uh, the goal would be to, to not have to necessarily expose uh, the children to, to the virus itself. Um, but these trials are looking to begin sometime uh, mid-March uh, and probably be finished sometime uh, before the beginning of summer. Uh, so they're, they're just around the corner here. Great. There's a lot of questions about specific choices, about whether or not they should get a vaccine. Obviously, which vaccine they should get may be something that we can find out in the future. But if people want to learn more, have specific questions about themselves, what are the best resources for them to look at? Are there particular websites, uh, particular resources that you would recommend? And perhaps Dr. Conway could comment first. Well, I mean, the CDC obviously has done a really nice job of trying to curate and put things together. They have a, It gets a little busy on some of their websites. So I personally like www.immunize.org, which is the Immunization Action Coalition. And they've got a really nice COVID vaccine site that actually has links to a lot of these other. Um, so I think if people want to kind of a one-stop shopping, I think that's probably one of the more reliable and easy to use websites that's out there. Right. And I mean, relying on their personal doctor as well, is that is that a good resource for people to make those those individual decisions? Sure, absolutely. Especially people that have underlying medical conditions or just have questions about, you know, particular nuances of their own health condition. It's always smart to talk to your primary provider. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the next pandemic, because I think all virologists and immunologists have an understanding that uh, this was just a matter of time and that we will likely have another pandemic in the future and possibly even with some, within our lifetimes. Uh, so first to Johan, can you speak about some of the research that Mortgage Institute is doing on antivirals and how that could change the, the game for a future pandemic? Sure, I'm happy to. So that, that segues a little bit out of the vaccine realm. Um, so if you think about what we do against bacterial infections, we have antibiotics and several antibiotics can, can kill um, multiple different kinds of bacteria because they have a general action. Um, with vaccines, you're really targeting one specific virus. You have to make a new vaccine for every new virus that comes along. And who knows out of what corner and what kind of virus is gonna be the next epidemic. So at Mortgage, what we're trying to do, and I briefly touched on this, is uh, the largest class of viruses and that's coronavirus is a member of that, are these positive strand RNA viruses. That's by far the largest class of viruses. And they all need to build this RNA copying machine, which they dedicate the a significant part of their genetic information uh, towards. So at Mortgage, we're really interested in studying that process. How does RNA get copied? What do these machines, these molecular machines look like? And how can we design based on what these things look like the structure, how we can, we can, can we design drugs, small chemicals that will jam up that machine. And if we can do that, hopefully we can find some drugs that can target that machinery for multiple different kinds of viruses. So we're, then we're really starting to talk about broad spectrum antiviral drugs, which would be great to have. And that's really what we focus on at the Mortgage Institute. Great. And, uh, Dr. Hartman, so in terms of you know what we learned about the convalescent plasma trials and even the antibiotic cocktails that are available, do you think that you know that knowledge that we've gained during this pandemic is something that would maybe help us react more quickly in a future pandemic? I hope so. Uh, when coronavirus came to the United States, it already had caused havoc in in China, uh, in Italy. Um, and, and when it came here, it was beginning to, to, to take on the, the same mannerisms. Um, and to that point, there had only been 27 patients that we know of that were treated with convalescent plasma uh, be, before we started using it here. Um, and, and that came out of a, a China study. And so uh, the fact that we didn't immediately jump on using convalescent plasma right away uh, it's something perhaps we just didn't didn't consider it strongly enough initially, um, but I would think uh, lessons learned. Uh, we will jump to it quickly uh, next time if if this were to to happen again. Um, in terms of the monoclonal antibodies, uh, the, the the cloning process that it takes to to make 
those antibodies uh, went incredibly fast, actually. From, from the time that they first uh, were scanning the convalescent plasma to the time they had an effective medicine going into people was only about 92 days. And so it was incredibly fast. So uh, if we can think of these things early, um, and if we have the, the money and the wherewithal to, uh, to produce them, I think that, that we can jump on future pandemics uh, much more quickly than, than even we did here. And Dr. Conway, is, is mRNA te vaccine technology something, is it kind of the future? Is it something we're gonna see a lot more of going forward? Yeah, I think that's what it's been poised to do. In fact, you know, a lot of these efforts were based on the early work to develop Ebola vaccines and Zika vaccines. You know, and the nice thing about the mRNA vaccines is once you have the genetic material sorted out for the virus, you can very quickly figure out what, what an mRNA vaccine needs to look like. You don't need to spend months learning how to grow the virus and grow it in large batches. You're basically able to just crank out that particular part of this. And, and that's the reason that, as Dr. Hartman mentioned, you know, both Pfizer and Moderna are going to be able to then keep modifying to continue to keep up with all these different mutations as they happen. And I could readily see that, you know, as these viruses keep mutating and changing, that we give people boosters periodically and we sort of keep updating the vaccines to address whatever the antigen changes are that each of these viruses goes through. And so that's the nice thing about the mRNA technology. It can be brought to bear really quickly. It can be modified very quickly. And, you know, people had been working on it for years to figure it out. And this was really sort of a great example of how quickly it can be, can be put into action. And then uh, just to wrap it up, I think the final question I have is, do you have uh, reasons for hope? I know this has been a long, long year for a lot of people um, and for, for you all as well in terms of the work you were doing. Um, I, I was hoping you could leave uh, with what you, what, what you find hopeful about the future. All of us, I, I mean, I'll start. I, you know, I'm yeah. incredibly optimistic at already what we've seen with what people are willing to do to mitigate you know, spread of the disease while we've rapidly developed these vaccines. And if we can continue to do what we've already done, which is set up really great broad distribution um, systems, as soon as we get enough supply and get people immunized, you know, I think we could get to a point where even by summer when we're more outdoors, that life starts to feel a lot more normal and, and, and like what we're used to. I think we need people to, to continue doing what they're doing while we wait to have enough vaccine available and need to encourage people to, to read and ask questions so that they're comfortable getting vaccinated. But once we get pe enough people vaccinated, I think life gets to back, back to what we want it to be. And, and I'll echo those, those same sentiments and then also take it the, the, the question in a slightly different direction um, because I'm, I'm very hopeful for the world that my kids get to grow up, grow, grow up in because we saw it through the convalescent plasma program, the goodness of people. Uh, we had to rely on people in the community to donate this resource. And they came out of the woodwork to do so. Uh, they came out of the woodwork to save their neighbors. Uh, we saw it here in Madison. We saw it throughout the United States. And, and the fact that someone is willing to help someone that they've never even met, uh, that gives me tremendous hope uh, and really shows me that some good can come out of these pandemics as well. Fabulous. Yeah, I'll just I'll just echo what's been said. You know, I think there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel, and that's good for everybody. Um, you know, it should be a much better year than the one we just closed off. Um, and I'm also just amazed with how the research community has come together. And if you if you go into the coronavirus literature, there's too much to keep up with, and and that's just that's just as a researcher myself, that's just that's just really fascinating and shows you what's possible when everybody comes together and starts tackling a problem. Uh, and I'm hope that's being recognized in the larger community in the sense that, you know, people value the importance of the science that all underlies all of this and how, how, de how dependent we're all on, the, on that to continue. And uh, I'm glad that, uh, that this is a great example to uh, promote that. Fabulous. Well, thank you all so much for joining us and, and dedicating some some extra time on top of what we had planned uh, to answer some additional questions. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, you will uh, see a, 
uh, note at the top of the screen if you want to sign up for the Mortgage Institute newsletter. And we also have a, a special sticker offer, a virology themed sticker. Um, if you would like to uh, get that, that's available for you. Um, this session will be available as a recording. Uh, we will send it out by email to the email address you registered at. And so you can see that in the in the coming days. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, please take care.